Hello and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr. This program is coming to you from Merge in downtown Iowa City and is being live streamed as well. Tonight's program is the kickoff event for the 2022 Provost Global Forum on the topic Teaching and Frank. Sponsored by International Programs with major funding from the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, the Provost Global Forum is the premier annual event on campus focused on international and global issues. In addition to World Canvas, this year's forum from February 28th to March 2nd features a series of public events including panel discussions, a film screening, an exhibit called Let Me Be Myself, The Life Story of Anne Frank, and the Joel Barkin Memorial Lecture given by the director of the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. You'll find more details at international.uiowa.edu slash teachingannefrank. We have an exceptional group of guests this evening who will discuss Anne's life before and after she and her family went into hiding, the experience of the Jewish community living in the Netherlands under Nazi occupation, the impact her private diary has had on subsequent generations, and her place in both public history and the struggle for human rights. The topic we've asked our first panel to address is Anne Frank and public history. I'm honored to introduce Ronald Leopold at the far end of our uh, uh, panel set up here. Ronald Leopold, director of the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, next to me is Doyle Stevick, the executive director of the Anne Frank Center at the University of South Carolina. Thank you, Doyle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And a very special welcome to Kirsten Kumpf Bale, a lecturer and the outreach coordinator in the Department of German here at the University of Iowa. Uh, Kirsten is really, in many ways, uh, largely responsible for a whole series of events related to Anne Frank that will be happening here uh, this month and then all the way through the spring. So thank you, Kirsten, for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 75 years after the publication of the Diary of Anne Frank, historians, educators, human rights activists, and readers of all ages and nationalities continue to find beauty, humor, tragedy, and hope in the words of a young girl whose life ended in a Nazi death camp as World War II drew to a close. Um, Ron, I imagine that as the director of the Anne Frank House, you know about as much as anyone about the experiences of the Frank family. Uh, Otto Frank, Anne's father, was the only member of the family to survive the Holocaust, and uh, we wonder if you can tell us how it is that he discovered his diary and what it meant that he decided to publish it. Um. Ooh, I will try to summarize that in a few <laughs> lines because it's a kind of a, well, uh, as everything that con concerns Anne is obviously uh, something that we could talk on for hours and hours. Um, so Otto Frank, um, let, me, let me start by the moment the, the family was arrested on August the 4th, 1944, uh, cause of which is still not, not, uh, not clear uh, whether the family was betrayed. Like, I don't know if you followed the news lately, but there is a lot of things going on about a new book uh, and about a new theory about the betrayal. Uh, but again, it's not sure whether they were betrayed and if they were betrayed, by whom they were betrayed. So this is a, 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 an interesting, interesting thing in itself. Uh, Otto and the family were deported to the transit camp of Westerbork in the north of Holland, where they stayed for four weeks. And then on the last train that left the Netherlands for Auschwitz on September the 3rd, 1944, they were deported to Auschwitz, where uh, they were separated. It was not just the Frank family, it was also the other family in hiding, the Van Pels family, and Anne's roommate, the dentist, you might know Fritz Pfeffer. Um, and finally, uh, Anne, Margot, and, uh, and, 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 the, the, and Miss Van Pels, they were deported uh, probably in November, by the end of October, beginning of November 1944, from Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen. It tells you something about the status of the camp, the concentration camp and, 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 and um, uh, of Auschwitz, which by that time was already kind of a different camp than 1942-1943 because the Germans needed slave laborers. They needed the slave laborers in, in Germany, so each and every one who was still able to work was deported to, to Bergen-Belsen. Otto stayed in, uh, in Auschwitz and was liberated in Auschwitz uh, on 
the date of liberation of Auschwitz, January 27, 1945. It took him five months to get home, to get home to Amsterdam. It was only by June 1945 that he returned to, uh, to Amsterdam, going through the Ukraine, of all places mm. now, uh, the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula, Greece, France, and finally ended up in Amsterdam beginning of June. By the time he already knew that his wife has died, had died, but he didn't know anything about the fate of his two girls, so he went to the central railway station of Amsterdam every day to look for them and to ask about them when he finally heard the news after a couple of weeks that they had both died in, in the camp of Bergen-Belsen. Um, by that time, uh, he learned that one of their helpers, famous name probably, Mipchis, uh, managed to save some of, the, some of the papers of the diary of Anne Frank, so some of them still missing. Uh, and she gave them to Otto. Um, and it's interesting to see that he, during the two years between the moment he got these, news, these papers and the date of publication of the diary by him, 1947, June 1947, it's interesting to see how he, in a way, develops a kind of a mission that he is linking to this diary, a mission that is very much future-focused, of course, the diary is about the experience of Anne during the time of hiding. But for Otto, it's a, it's a book that should help, um, help to contribute to make the world a better place, to make the world a better place than the one he had, left his, he had lost his, his entire family in. So for Otto, I think, and that's the start of all this wide variety of engagements with the work of Anne, with her life that we've seen over the decades, in a way that starts with Otto, with his choices, how to engage with the, with the work of his daughter and his mission that he basically have been, has been working on ever until his death in 1980. Mm -hmm. And uh, did he self-publish this book initially, or did he find a publisher? Well, it? yeah, it's, an, it, 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 it's difficult, you know, to imagine now that he really had difficulties to find a publisher for the book mm -hmm. because nobody was interested in it yeah. uh, in 1945. Uh, people thought, you know, let's, forget about, let's mm -hmm. forget about the war. We want to forget about it. We want to focus on the future. So why bother with this? Mm -hmm. So many, many of the publishers that he turned to, uh, rejected it, and then finally, a publishing house called uh, Contact uh, finally uh, finally mm -hmm. published the diary in a very edited way, the, the, the way uh, Otto Frank edited mm -hmm. the the diary papers of his daughter. Hmm. So, uh, obviously, you're the director of the Anne Frank House. Uh, for many of us, it's considered sort of a holy place, and if you go to to the Netherlands, you you go. Uh, pay a visit to this museum, to this house. And um, the last time I was there was, I don't know, five years ago maybe. And it has, it has um, evolved over time. And uh, your educational mission, I suspect, has also evolved over time. What is it that you and the museum are trying to do to tell Anne's story to current and future generations? Yes, it has evolved over time, but what has remained the same is the fact that the house remained empty. We sometimes say we're probably the only museum in the world that has nothing else to offer than empty spaces. Yeah. Uh, and this emptiness is something very telling, and I think the most powerful feature also of the, ha of, the, of the house. Because, first and foremost, it tells us that the absence of Anne Frank, she's mm -hmm. not with us anymore. She was killed at the age of 15 in the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. Uh, it tells us something about the emptiness in the heart of a father who had lost his entire family. It tells us something about the emptiness of a city having lost 80,000 of its inhabitants, 10% of it, its inhabitants, for the single reason that they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think the emptiness of the house tells us something about what has happened. But to us, and to Otto actually, the house, the emptiness of the house also serves as a mirror. So we look into that mirror, this is us. Mm -hmm. This is what we are capable of, you know, and we see many things. We are capable of the worst things that we have to offer, but we also see people who were helping 
the Franks throughout these 25 months that they were in hiding, risking their own lives in order to save that of others. Mm -hmm. So we see many things in the emptiness of the Anne Frank house. And actually the emptiness also encourages people to reflect on this. To, we invite them to, to think about not just what has happened, but why it has happened. <laughs> And then the third step, I think these are also to us the three pillars of the educational approach of, of the Anne Frank House, which is we should remember what has happened, we should reflect on why it has happened, and then the third step, very important to us, we'd like you to respond in your own community to what you just learned or reflected. Mm -hmm. So, and very much reaching out to young people because, you know, they are going to build the world they are going to live in. Um, and Anne's voice is their voice. So, um, so I already, I always feel, especially now when we've heard, you know, criticism about young girls connecting to Anne because they were in a lockdown and Anne was in hiding and, and, and I understand the criticism, but you know, when you try to, to when, when that would be the only criteria in terms of getting as close to Anne's experience as possible, I think we would lose a lot of significance of everything the book and her biography actually has to offer to us. So although I, 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 I share and, and understand the worthy concerns about um, you know, the, 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 the historical accuracy of, 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 the, uh, of, the, of the history, I do think that we should consider all these engagements with the book, with our life, as a phenomenon in and of itself, which has a huge significance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, museums are very special places and the kinds of tools that are available to you to, um, to use video, to use audio recordings, to use uh, uh, newsreels and whatnot, that we've even gone a step beyond that, haven't we, in terms of creating sort of, you know, virtual reality spaces. Um, what kinds of concerns do you have as museum director about this kind of engagement and in employing new sorts of experiences? I think, I, I think of myself as being very modern, but my staff is completely in disagreement with that. They think I'm hugely conservative when it comes to new media and the use of new media in, uh, in, in telling Anne's story. Uh, and, and in hindsight, I always, you know, they're always right. So every step that we've taken, whether it was in comics, and I know Oren has done a wonderful work on, on comics, or whether it was on in, in the video diary that we published uh, two years ago. Uh, so there are many, many ways of mediating the story of Anne that I found sometimes upsetting, to mm -hmm. be very honest mm -hmm. with you. Uh, and in hindsight, I, I think they're wonderful in a way. So um, this is a way to try to not to answer your question, actually, because when it comes <laughs> to holograms, <laughs> um, I feel, uh, and it might be because I'm yeah. so. It might be because I'm too conservative, but I, I do feel uh, a hologram in within the let's say the hologram of Anne Frank mm -hmm. in her room, yeah. in that place. To be very honest, I mm -hmm. still have five years to go before I retire. <laughs> I very much hope it's not going to yeah. happen within those yeah. five yeah. years. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and the question would be why? So why would I be so 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 hesitant to do so? Mm -hmm. And I think. For holograms, I think it's also because I feel there is, you know, on a topic that has always been uh, vulnerable for whether it has happened and whether the diary has been the diary of Anne Frank. And so in terms of reality and the sense of reality, I think hologram technology takes a step towards, in, towards a direction that I am very, uh, very afraid of, actually. So... Um, and by the way, I don't think a holo I just mentioned something about the concept of the museum. I don't think a hologram of Anne Frank would fit in, mm -hmm. into such a concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, um, I, I want to move next to Doyle because you are uh, our partner in bringing the Let Me Be Myself exhibit from the University of South Carolina and your Anne Frank Center there. So you're Doyle Stevick. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Please tell us about the Anne Frank Center at the University of South Carolina. How did this all get started? Oh, um, 
It's such a pleasure to be the official partner of the Anne Frank House and to have the uh, new exhibition at the University of South Carolina. Um, I was working in Central and Eastern Europe um, and looking for ways to find education that can undercut prejudices and build pro-social dispositions and affect positive behaviors. I was looking in the frame of civic education. I went to study democratization in post-Soviet uh, spaces. And when I was there, there was such a backlash about the Holocaust mm -hmm. because for countries that were first overrun by the Soviets and then the Nazis came in a few years, but then the Soviets won and stayed for 50, uh, they often understood history as the Soviets were the bad guys and the Nazis liberated them. That's not an easy place to fight anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And I saw one set of experts after another come in and try to tell people what to think. And nobody responds well to that. But there was one group that did everything differently, and that was the Anne Frank House. And it was their peer education method that worked like magic in my view. And they would come in and they'd say, we have a story to share, but we'll learn your languages, we'll learn your cultures. And uh, this is the story of a young person. Uh, maybe for you, like it was for me, Anne Frank is the only child who appears in the curriculum that you get to know intimately in her own voice. There's no other child that you get to know as a child. We don't have Emmett Till's words. We don't get to know him so personally. And Anne is always so immediate. Whenever you read it, it's relevant, and you wish it wasn't. But now with the conflict in Ukraine, you see children huddled by bathtubs, and you read the diary and her words about running into her parents' bed because she's trembling with fear at the bombs falling. Um, we wish it weren't so immediate. But in that context, that approach where you go in and, and you speak with people and you share a story and, and you hear their stories, you can disagree and do that civilly. And it was this method of open conversation and dialogue that was respectful and culturally informed uh, that made the approach of the Anne Frank House educators so different. And the whole peer education idea is based on the notion that children have a voice. Uh, Anne teaches us that. But our young people often don't get that message, right? They're not told that. They don't hear that, even if intuitively they know it. Because our young people all understand the negative power of peer pressure. But they don't always understand the flip side, their potential to bring out the best in one another. And that's why I was so taken with the Anne Frank House work. They, 35 years ago, realized most people can't come to Amsterdam and have that powerful experience. So they developed these traveling exhibits. They've swept the world, been in 89 countries. Uh, but what makes it special and what makes it Anne Frank House work is that peer education component because young people take it in and, and respond to it in their own words in a way and process it in a way their peers hear that they could never get from me. Um, and they're more interested in learning from one another than they are from mm -hmm. somebody like me. So that chance to um, uh, help them find their voice and talk to one another and hear from a peer I think ultimately helps them engage with Anne as well because um, her voice just rings so true. Mm -hmm. Well, so you and some of your colleagues from South Carolina have, have been here two or three times mm. to help uh, train the uh, folks here at the University of Iowa, students and also museum uh, personnel, yes. to, to be prepared to share the Let Me Be Myself uh, exhibit. Um, how, yeah. how has that all gone? Oh, I've, I've been delighted with how that's turned out. Uh, the trainers we have are such special people. They not only have to know the Holocaust history, the Anne Frank history, but then they pick up this set of activities that the Anne Frank House has developed over the years, picking up ideas from all over the world and incorporating them back into this model. And so these activities are, are beautiful to run. Uh, and when you find people who can run them effectively with uh, young people around the country, uh, they do amazing things. So in two full days of immersion, young people can come through and be prepared not to transmit history, right? Not to share facts, but to get at those deeper educational goals, not just building skills, but how do you actually get at attitudes and dispositions? How do you hopefully get to behavior ultimately? That's what we're all trying to achieve. 
uh, but it's easier said than done. I think it takes these kind of interactive conversations, a deep uh, connection. Uh, so our guides, ideally, are leading moral conversations. And if there's one thing that they seem to all take away, it's the importance of not being a bystander. Um, we have to be upstanders, and we celebrate Meep Geese and the other helpers, uh, but there simply were not enough of them. And there never will be, because it's scary to stand up at the risk of your own life to help others. We can't count on heroic individuals alone to do that. We need together to form communities of upstanders, uh, because if I know you have my back and you know I have yours, it's easier for us to stand up together. And when we stand up together, build a community of upstanders, we're not swimming upstream anymore. We are the stream. And that's ultimately the kind of cultural change we all need if we're going to build the kind of world where Anne can reach her potential and live her full life. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Doyle. Um, and now I'd like to go to Kirsten, uh, Kirsten kumpf Bale. Uh, so you teach here at the university, and uh, I understand you teach a course on Anne Frank's diary. Um, tell us how your students respond. Thank you. In, in my course, I really see the power of community um, in my class. And I think the, you know, we, we look at Anne's text, and through Anne's text, each one of my students sees a part of themselves in some way. Um, and, you know, they, they just like Doyle mentioned, um, the students, they share stories of themselves, they share stories of their families, um, they connect with students that they may not have connected with or shared information with in the classroom, um, you know, before even coming there. And, um, in the class, one of the exercises that the students have to do is they have to journal. Mm -hmm. um, and I allow students to journal in you know whatever form is comfortable for them. Um, and I've had such a rich array of submissions. Um, I've had students from music who have composed pieces. Um, I've had students who have put together montages. I have had students who write letters to um, either Anne or to the Annex members. Um, they, they really are able to articulate their own um, concerns that they're currently having, um, worldly issues that they, that they witness. Um, and Anne's text is the, the vehicle through which they are able to, to process their own realities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to be sure that we touch on here, because it's so incredibly special, is the proposal you submitted some years ago mm -hmm. to bring one of the saplings from the chestnut tree that Anne and her family looked at from the annex, uh, to have one of those saplings planted here on the campus of the University of Iowa. And that will happen in April, and largely thanks to your hard work, so bravo for that. But um, tell us about this sapling project, and why do you think that matters? Um, when I when I found out that there were a few select saplings um, planted in the United States, I had this big dream that I would bring one of these saplings to the University of Iowa and to Iowa City. I, I see Anne as an international writing figure. I feel that she fits in here so perfectly. Um, the University of Iowa also has um, a number of other historical trees on campus that many people don't know about. Um, the tree that is coming in April um, will be the first tree that um, represents also a female figure, um, which is really powerful, I think. Um, and, you know, I, I see Anne's story taking root here, and um, students are able to come to this space. Um, members of the community are able to come to this space, and the tree will grow and, you know, evolve and change and um, everyone can connect with it. Um, it's a living memorial in that sense, and it's bringing um, her story here. And my students are currently incorporating um, the sapling into their own into their own coursework um, by reflecting on what the sapling means to them um, and connecting it with other sites um, of historical significance throughout the state of Iowa. 
Wow, terrific. Well, um, I, I think we're all going to enjoy the planting and then just watching this tree grow and change over time and, and hopefully our connection with both the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam and the Anne Frank Center in South Carolina, that perhaps that can all grow and, and become something more constant here at the university as well. Um, I'm afraid we've reached the end of uh, this first segment, so I'd like to thank Ronald Leopold very much, uh, Doyle Stevick, and Kirsten Kump. Bale for being with us. And um, please stay with us for part two of World Canvas when we'll speak more specifically about how to teach Anne Frank. Um, please give our guests a, a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
which feels less familiar. How do we then move to that world? And what I find fascinating is the ways that they are then able to say, ah, okay, how do we move from not only the sort of factual Holocaust education that happens through Anne Frank, but the education in empathy, the education um, in personal connection, how do they then expand on that to, to parts of this history that are a little less familiar? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that brings me a lot of pleasure to do that because I can see them building on something important that's happened in their education and pushing even a little bit further to a stage that of course is equally important when we think about things like genocide prevention today. Um, one question that always arises is how do we think about um, atrocities that happen among people who we don't feel close to, right? How do we make those connections? And I see, like I say, I see this as part of an ecosystem um, of education, and I'm really glad to have colleagues that do a number of different parts of this of this this whole function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are some of the other um, parts of Jewish history uh, that that you explore in the courses you teach? It's a really good. It's a, that's that's a, it's a very important topic. Of goodbye water bottle. <laughs> um, one thing that I have learned. You know, I, I have my PhD in German history, and I've been going to Holocaust education conferences for longer than most of my students have been alive. So, you know, really have a good sense of what's going on in that world. And one thing that I have learned is that studying atrocity tells you more about the perpetrators and their enablers than it actually does about the victims. Mm -hmm. Now, Anne Frank, the teaching of Anne Frank is a wonderful example of how to counter that because we are digging into the worlds and the lived experience of a victim. But in terms of understanding how atrocities happen, it's not the victims that make them happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I, and that's an important part of the teaching because I think that in teaching things like this, we need to not only empathize with the victims, but we need to think very hard. Again, the, the notion of looking in the mirror, we need to think hard about how we might become accomplices or perpetrators or bystanders. That's a very important part of the education, but it gets us farther and farther away from understanding Jewish history in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, there is a tremendous public interest in the Holocaust, and of course, a lot of people get a lot of Jewish education through a course in the Holocaust. Um, I have students, I, I also teach a course, I'm doing a course right now that's just more firmly in Jewish studies in its own right, and I have many students who have taken more than one course related to the Holocaust, and three weeks into the course, they're telling me, I didn't know the first thing about Jews or Jewish life, right? It is actually hard to get that when you're seeing them only at the moment of immense persecution and pretty soon mass death. So this is another entryway that I really like. Students become intimately involved with this teenage girl. Um, and then there's ways to sort of say, let's learn more about this culture she comes from. In the immediate family, it was a fairly assimilated German Jewish culture. But of course, the history goes back beyond her birthplace in Frankfurt. Right in the, in the interwar period, um, the history of Jews in Europe and elsewhere goes back much farther, and there's so much more to discuss. And I really feel it's important, and I get a lot of reward out of bringing students to think about what does it mean to study the history of Jews and Judaism that's not only about persecution. Mm -hmm. There's an immensely rich life, there's an immensely rich culture, there's religiosity, there is history, there's ritual, lived experience, migrations, all sorts of things going on that we miss when we look only at the moments of persecution. So in my Holocaust class, which we mainly we're talking about the Holocaust, I devote one week of the course, the second week of the course, to Jewish life in Europe before the Holocaust. We have only one week for that. Already that is pretty mind-blowing for a lot of my students um, to realize 
how diverse Jewish life was before the Holocaust, what it meant in terms of varieties of religiosity, varieties of economic positioning, varieties of political philosophies. Uh, there's so much going on. And that, to me, is also a wonderful th way that we can build on Anne Frank educa education about Anne Frank to sort of see what happens next. Mm -hmm. What happens when we sort of dig a little bit into, into this closely related subject that we often overlook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, Maya, that leads very naturally, I think, to the work you do. Uh, you, in uh, your work with social studies, uh, you explore the teaching and learning of difficult histories, whether it's slavery, genocide, any of the things that are really very, very hard to study, very hard to uh, admit that we have all, many of us, been part of in our historical past. Um, what kinds of decisions do teachers have to make in presenting this material to their students at a given age? You can choose the age, but clearly teachers have to be sensitive to how students will receive the information and um, uh, the best way to get it to them. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's just so wonderful to think about having that time to dig into content so deeply, to give that context to help understand who Anne was, what was happening around her, um, but oftentimes when you think about secondary school teachers in particular, they don't have that time to dig deeply um, into the Holocaust itself, let alone into the life of one child. So oftentimes there's just excerpts and not the whole diary mm -hmm. or things like that. Um, social studies teachers are, if you're teaching the Holocaust, you're often teaching global history or even if you're teaching U.S. history, you are often going from war to another war <laughs> to horrible things that people have done to each other over time. And so when I work with teachers, we really want to think about why are we teaching this? What is the purpose of looking at these horrible things that we have done to each other? Um, and how can we help students learn this? And so one of the most important decisions that teachers can make is to have that purpose. Do I want to teach about human rights when I teach about Anne Frank? Do I want to encourage them to ask questions about um, what it means to make ethical decisions? Do I want them to understand the dangers of um, a crumbling democracy and what can happen with autocracy? What is it that you are doing? And I think so teachers need to be able to make these choices when they bring the suffering into their classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, another thing that teachers, especially there are so many teachers who are passionate about teaching the Holocaust and about teaching Anne Frank and really see the Holocaust as a vehicle for change, that this will motivate students to understand something about humanity, that will motivate students to care about history, to care about other people. Um, and we really need to be careful when we have those assumptions about what students will care about and how can we foster a sense of connection and inquiry so that the students are engaged and this when a teacher is thinking about this there has to be the sense of we are not all going to come to the same place and in education we set objectives we have measurable outcomes, and so we want our students to have these, these set outcomes of why am I doing this here, this is what's going to happen. But that doesn't always happen, and so to create, I just love that sense of a space and emptiness at times to allow students to come to their own meaning. I have this purpose. I'm choosing my learning materials in this purpose. But because you are who you are, and because we are in this unique time, learning about the Holocaust right now in a classroom would be very different than someone maybe who learned about it in the fall, thinking about what's happening in Europe right now. So creating that space for students to express their emotions, their concerns, and their questions, I think, is deeply important. Yeah. And, and uh, how does a teacher um, uh, internalize the, the struggles she or he may have um, when you go into a topic, any, any kind of um, 
really brutal, difficult subject is is not only going to have the thing that you deliver to the students, but it's also the thing that lives in your heart as a teacher as you're beginning to think about how you can best present the material and how you can have that conversation with one student who seems especially quiet and maybe is you're sensing that there's something that's troubling them. Um, what what do teachers really have to deal with? I, I'm a kid of a teacher. I know teachers carry a lot home with them, and they they we all know that teachers are undervalued. I think, but with these really tough subjects and students who may be struggling with them, I think it's a heavy burden. I think it is, and it's not something that teachers are often have community to talk about with, and so yeah. it's something that they do take home. Or, um, I think now with social media, there's more outlets for people to share concerns and questions, resources. Um, I think that there is a danger, and so that's something I talk about with, with teachers, is when we teach these difficult histories, these histories of oppression and suffering, um, we want students to understand the dire consequences of choices and systems that oppress people. And so we want to show what might happen. We want to hear the voices and perspectives of the victims, um, but we don't only want to see them as victims. And so finding ways to show, and I think Anne Frank does such a beautiful job of this, what is our humanity in our suffering? What is, in what ways do people continue to live their lives, love and dream and, and, and try to be their full selves in places where that is what is most dangerous to other people for you to be fully yourself and so how do we bring in stories of hope and resilience and resistance and i think when we create space for that especially resistance within in in the curriculum then we can teachers can help students um, not feel completely overwhelmed by the sadness and what has happened but to think about what do we do with this mm -hmm. knowledge and i think that is important for teachers again in that purpose why am I looking at this? How can I help make sense of this? I think is deeply important for teachers and students. Right, right. Well, thank you. Well, and, and we can come now to our, our student on the panel. Uh, Anna, you are just about ready to graduate and a very accomplished student. I know you're an honors student. And um, uh, Kirsten recommended you as a student who could speak to many of the things we're talking about tonight. The effect Anne Frank's story has had on your uh, life as a student. I know you studied with uh, Kirsten in the uh, Anne Frank course, but you've also taken the training to um, uh, share with others the exhibit in the Pentecost Museums. So please tell us how you became interested in this, in this young woman. Well, I actually didn't read Anne Frank's diary until I came to college and I read it for uh, Dr. Kumpfbaile's class. Mm -hmm. And so I think my my interest kind of started taking that course and really digging into her story and seeing how how her story inspired so many others to be published and so many other people to come forward about their same experiences or experiences with the same event but very different experiences and yeah it's kind of snowballed from there like i um the next semester i was the teaching assistant for that course mm. um most recently i did the training for the the museum as you mentioned um yeah, and I think, I think what's so special about Anne's story and what I've really taken from it is just how many people can apply it, some part of it, to themselves and really connect to it in that way. There are so many aspects of Anne and of her story that people can relate to. Like, I relate to her as a writer. Um, we heard earlier about the journaling activity that um, the students in that course do. And so for one of my journal entries, I wrote a short story inspired by one of her short stories that she had written that we read in class. Um, so yeah, that, that's just an example. But I think there are so many opportunities for students from all different backgrounds to connect with different aspects of her story. And I think that's what makes it so important and um, universal and just significant that we teach it and keep learning it. Mm -hmm. And when you have uh, taken people through the exhibit, have they generally been school-aged uh, visitors to the museum that you have uh, taken through? I have taken mostly college-age kids mm -hmm. um, and also my relatives came last weekend and so I did a little tour for them. Yeah. Um, 
but it's yeah specifically with the the college age students that came through it was my presentation was a lot about um, getting them to talk about their identities and mm -hmm. trying to see that side mm -hmm. of the story and um, I was I was presenting the more contemporary um, section the the exhibit is organized with a contemporary section about like prejudice as a whole how mm -hmm. to be an upstander and then the other section is more specifically Anne's story right. and so I was with the the contemporary section and so a lot of what I talked about was how trying to get the students to think about the parts of their identities that set them apart or bring them closer to others mm -hmm. um, because that's what that's what I think is most important about um, about Anne's story, learning about the prejudices that like caused it to happen that way, and then seeing where in your life you can counter similar prejudices in mm -hmm. smaller ways, certainly, but in significant ways to people who are affected by it. Sure, and uh, you know we live in an historical moment too. There, we all know that there are prejudices uh, in our society and other places in the world against one group or another. Um, are the students that you have talked with, either in the Anne Frank course or in the um, uh, exhibit, are, are they quite willing to talk about themselves, their fears, their experiences? It takes a little bit of badgering, mm. I think. Um, mm -hmm especially with um, in like a classroom setting people yeah. the students don't know each other a lot of times mm -hmm. starting out but that's what I think is um, it was really special about that course was we made a little classroom community people mm -hmm. felt comfortable after a, a few course or a few class periods to um, speak more personally about mm -hmm. their experiences and the activities that we did also kind of helped that, helped yeah. people open up, think about themselves and their own stories and where they come from mm -hmm. and where they can meet others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, so this whole experience really in so many ways is about social justice writ large, defined perhaps differently by different groups of people. But, you know, what's fair, what's not fair, what what is... Um, just and um, Lisa if you don't mind maybe I'll come back to you and to Maya and ask you with your students do you find that there there is uh, there is a willingness to engage on these really tough topics to sort of to let a little bit of your own personal ethical setting out into that larger space where really you have to be quite trusting of the people who are in the course with you and of the professor you may say something that at first might not be what the professor thinks they want to hear creating a good classroom environment is absolutely essential to this kind of teaching. Students have to feel a lot of trust with each other. They have to feel a lot of trust with the instructor. Um, when I teach classes like this, we um, do a lot in the first couple of weeks of the semester to build community before we start mm -hmm. diving into the hard discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean just telling them that I'm non-judgmental and that they can try out ideas because that's what higher education is all about. That means class exercises that have them speaking one-on-one -on -one to each other. It means things that have them getting up and moving around the room so they can feel comfortable emerging from, physically mm -hmm. emerging from their shell. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. There's a lot of pedagogy involved beyond subject matter mastery yeah. in this kind of stuff. And I mean, I will say this semester I'm teaching two classes and I really feel like I've won the lottery um, because <laughs> they have created those kinds of communities, right? Um, and that's not always a given, right? dynamics can change from semester to semester partly just depending on who's in the class but also partly depending on what's happening in the world and mm -hmm. what has shaped them students right now um, spent a good chunk of their teenage years in crisis situations and they're coming both with a lot of struggles personally and sometimes academically because these things are not you know we bring our whole person to the classroom we bring a whole person mm -hmm. to learning um, but it also means, I mean, it means that they've experienced a, in some ways a kind of vulnerability that comes often from real hardships and rough things that have been going on. But I'm finding students right now in many ways much more open to talking about this kind of stuff because there's no pretending mm -hmm. that, you know, oh, this is just a class. 
there's no pretending that nobody thinks that it's not just about this particular subject matter they've they've been through so much just to be in college and manage to stay in college um, that I've I've found them really very like I say willing to be more vulnerable than has sometimes been the case in the past mm -hmm. I would say so a lot of my students are pre-service teachers uh -huh. And so we are preparing them to go out into schools and to teach uh, you know, political science, history. Um, and I think as a field, the social studies embraces, promotes, encourages engaging with difficult topics and controversial issues. And I think um, right now, nationally, we are in a space where there's a lot of debate about that. Mm -hmm that has created a lot of stress on these pre-service teachers to fully understand um, the dissonance between what we view as significant, important work in the social studies classroom um, and messages from the world outside about what they should and shouldn't be talking about in the classroom. And so I think my students have a strong desire because they see the significance of teaching about controversial issues or, or, or difficult histories. I think they struggle to want clarity um, on something that I, we've just been talking about on how subjective and contextual and political all of this really is. Mm -hmm. um, so I think their, that desire to be a role model and to engage students in this work is, is deep within my, my teachers and my students. Um, I think that it's it's in this particular context we're really trying to figure out how to do that well. Mm -hmm. Well, and Anna, as you head out and perhaps you go into writing, um, I don't know what your your next um, interest area will be. I, uh, have you decided what you wanted to look for? No, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But but you know, what are, what are some of the main things that you are going to take from this final year of college? I think a lot of this year for me um, in my academic stuff has been just kind of pushing myself to do things I wouldn't normally do. I would never have done this freshman year of high or of college. Like, um, yeah, just kind of pushing myself out there, doing things that I'm not necessarily like on the track for. Because yeah. being an English major doesn't necessarily. Uh, mm -hmm predispose me to talk about Anne Frank, I mm. think. But um, yeah, this this semester also, I've been working on my translation final project, mm -hmm. um, German to English. Yeah. So um, engaging with some German history there, um, that's been really interesting, Exciting, yeah. so. Yeah, great. Well, thank you all for joining us for this segment. Anna Ellis, Maya Shepard, and Lisa Heineman really appreciate it very much. And I hope that all of you will stay with us for the third part of this program where the focus will be Anne Frank in history and human rights issues today. Uh, so please give our speakers a warm hand. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to World Canvas and our topic tonight, Teaching Anne Frank. Thank you all for joining us, whether you're here in the room with us or watching online. Uh, tonight's program is the opening event for the 2022 Provost Global Forum, and we invite you to attend in person or virtually the panel discussions that will take place tomorrow and Wednesday, as well as the Joel Barkin Memorial Lecture given by Ronald Leopold of the Anne Frank Museum, the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, on Wednesday evening. You can find more information about these events at international.uiowa.edu slash teaching and frank. I'd like to introduce our guests for this last part of the program. Esther Hugenholt is a rabbi at a Gudis Akim congregation in Iowa City, and she's sitting in the middle here. Thank you, Esther. Uh, Stephanie Morris is just next to me, and she's the director of the Refugee Alliance of Central Iowa. So thank you very much for coming over, Stephanie. And Wilhelm Schwendemann is dean and professor of the Department of Theological Education and Diaconal Studies at EH University in Freiburg, and the director of FIM Freiburg Institute of Human Rights Pedagogy. Thank you very much, Wilhelm, for joining us. 
So, uh, Esther, if I may, I'd like to start with you as part of our program. Um, as you know, we're talking about human rights uh, in this last segment of the program. Um, as mentioned earlier, you, the rabbi at Aguda Sakim, and interestingly, considering this conversation, you were born, I believe, in Amsterdam, yeah, and lived there sometime later in your life as well. Um, Obviously, our entire discussion, while focused on what we can learn from Anne Frank's experience, we have been trying to tell a larger story here about the degradation of human beings by powerful and merciless forces and the unimaginable violence that has been altogether too real. Uh, so I wonder if I could ask you to help us learn a little bit about human rights from the perspective of Jewish religious texts and from historical experience. Thank you very much, Joe. Now, I, I was very tempted to bring the actual Talmud but I only brought the <laughs> iPads. Um, obviously, this is a really, really broad scope of inquiry that I will not be able to do any kind of meaningful justice, but hopefully it will whet your appetite for further learning into the Jewish tradition. So the Jewish tradition has a broad and very deep and very ancient set of commentaries, both from the Torah, so that, that's the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, as well as the Hebrew Bible at large, which Christians would call the Old Testament, as well as the rabbinic writings. Um, and I, I just want to start with um, quoting something that Anne Frank herself, or Anne Frank, as I would say, herself wrote um, as kind of a launching pad for our discussion, because I thought it was very striking. She wrote, although I'm only 14, I know quite well what I want. I know who is right and who is wrong. I have my opinions, my own ideas and principles, and although it may sound pretty mad from an adolescent, I feel more of a person than a child. I feel quite independent of anyone. So you, she's basically speaking to this innate sense of right and wrong and this innate sense of personhood that she feels despite her world trying to deprive her of it. Um, and I think that's a great way to look at what Judaism or Jewish values teach about this. So any conversation about human rights in Judaism necessitates us to take a step back and look at what some of the core ideas in Jewish philosophy and theology are. So I've delineated three main points of Jewish theology and philosophy which will help us understand the question. So one is covenant theology that God is in relationship with human beings, not just Jews, but all human beings through a series of parallel covenants, and that with the, that covenant between human beings and God, that also becomes a model for the covenants that human beings keep with each other. From that devolves what we would call a universe of obligation. If I were really honest, I wouldn't call this human rights, I would call this human obligations, because Judaism doesn't really think in terms of rights. Judaism thinks in the other side of the coin, which is obligations. And when you, you uphold your obligations vis-a-vis -vis God, vis-a-vis -vis yourself, or even vis-a-vis vis-a-vis -vis other human beings, or even vis-a-vis -vis yourself, then the flip side of upholding that obligation is that you can derive from that obligation certain rights. And I know that sounds a little bit like nitpicking. Well, you know, I did study Talmud, so it comes with the territory. <laughs> but like, it's really important to understand that in Judaism, we don't necessarily phrase, I have a right to this, but I have an obligation to this. I have an obligation to be a guardian of my fellows' well-being, of my fellows' dignity, rather than I have a right to individual expression. So, which is runs counter to kind of post-enlightenment modern Western thinking, but I think it's a point worthy of contemplation. And of course, the third point being human universalism and dignity, which is encoded from the first chapter of Genesis, all throughout our, our tradition. Uh, the Jewish story is a particular story, but I always describe the Jewish people as a particular people with a universalist mission, right? So that through our particularism, through our maintenance of our own cultural and religious distinctiveness, we are actually able to be the bearers of universal message. Um, so just because we maintain our distinctiveness doesn't mean that we cannot speak to the human story at large and that 
I would argue, actually argue that Judaism is one of the first universalist religions of the world um, that encoded in ethical monotheism is the ability to not just imagine your own tribe as children of God, but to imagine all tribes and all nations as children of God. So within those three, I would delineate more specific kind of frameworks that I would just basically want to touch upon a little bit. The first uh, is B'Tselem Elohim, the idea that we are all image bearers of the divine, um, that we are created in the image of the divine. And since all humanity is created in the image of divine, then that becomes the, the grantor of our human rights. The, God is the placeholder, the great leveler for all of our human rights. Um, you know, when Cain and Abel had their tragic outcome where Cain killed Abel, the first human being, the accountability of that story was why, you know, why does the blood, the blood from the earth cries out, right? Like, you are held accountable for spilling that blood for killing an image bearer of the divine. Um, another concept, which is you know a little more implicit and less explicit in biblical texts, but definitely made explicit in rabbinic texts, is the idea of kvad habriot, the dignity or the honor. Kvad means honor, the honor of human beings. Right, that we need to treat human beings with a baseline respect because that is encoded in our moral philosophy. So you cannot do certain things to people, no matter who they are, because of the honor accorded to them, um, which sounds a lot like universal human rights. And then, of course, the last frame is, you could either call it gemilut chasadim, loving acts of kindness, or va'avta re'acha komocha, loving your fellow of your, like yourself, loving your neighbor like yourself, which is from Leviticus 19.18, right? That being able to empathize with the other as yourself, the golden rule, the inverse golden rule, however you want to call it, is a key guarantor of those human rights um, as well. So, you know, there are many stories and passages. I think the fact that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which you know, hence is not about, you know, sexual acts. It, it's about violent acts of inhospitality and not about sexual acts that are necessarily circumscribed as taboo. Um, figure so prominently, you know, the founding myth of our people, Yitziat Mizraim, the exodus from Egypt, um, you shall love the stranger for you are strangers in Egypt, are yet more of these textual anchors that we get, right? Like out of the crucible of trauma, we forge compassion, which goes entirely against human instincts, right? That is why generational trauma exists. That is why things get perpetuated again and again and again, because it's so hard to override. But the Torah's entire ethos that's mentioned more than any other commandment 36 times is that we override that trauma with compassion because of the radical empathy that we can display towards the other because the other is ourself. Um, there, there is a great rabbinic text that I have in my notes here that uses the analogy of um, coins being minted. Right? When a human being mints coins, they all come out identical. Even in the ancient world, they came out fairly identical. Um, but when God mints coins, they all come out unique. And there is this paradox that because of our uniqueness, because of our, of, of our unique value, we are actually bonded in radical equality to each other. That same Mishnah, that same rabbinic text, talks about one who kills one human being is as if they killed the world entire. One who saves the life of one human being is like they save the life of the world entire. So all of these create a web of mutuality, of mutual obligation, and embedded in that web is our human rights. And through sacred practice of, of Jewish religion, Jewish ethics, Jewish culture, Jewish learning, we hone 
those instincts all the time. That is the core message of the Torah, is that we continually have to engage in these sacred practices to hold that iron cast truth before our eyes always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, thinking of Anne's story then here, did, was she a girl who struggled with, uh, with ethics as she knew them as a young Jewish girl? Definitely. You know, I, I don't think Anne's family was particularly devout. They were a member of the reform congregation that I was a member of, too, in Amsterdam. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, I don't think her diary is, it's not the diary of an orthodox or an observant young woman, but it is the diary of someone who's really grounded in, well, all these principles that I described. And I think I would like to close with, I want to say it in Dutch first, because how can I not? <laughs> you know, um, I know it's annoying to Americans, but if I'm going to quote Bashem Omra in the name of Anna Frank, I should say it in Dutch and then translate it into English. <laughs> um, and I think I chose this quote because it's so um, paradigmatic for the paradox, this beautiful paradox that she lived with and that we Jews live with. Eens zullen wij toch weer mensen en niet alleen Joden zijn. One day we will be human beings again and not just Jews. We kunnen nooit alleen Nederlanders of alleen Engelsen of van welke natie ook worden. We can never just be Dutch people or English people or belong to what, what, whatever particular nation. Wij zullen daarnaast altijd Joden blijven. We will always remain Jewish besides that. And then she makes this amazing pivot because obviously this, in the context of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, was hugely traumatic. People were being persecuted because they're Jewish. But then she really takes it back. She says, wij willen het ook blijven. We want to stay Jewish. And from her particular identity, she evolves, you know, in her own teenage way, this incredible universal ethic that certainly guides me and my community to this day. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Esther. Ter terrific. Um, well, in, in this segment, as you know, we're talking about Anne's story, but also human rights. And one of the things that um, persists throughout time, apparently, is the refugee um, crisis that happens to different people at different times in different places. And Stephanie Morris, you're the director of the Refugee Alliance of Central Iowa. And um, I wonder if you can tell us something about the people you and your organization work with here in Iowa who are trying to find a way to make a new life. Sure. Um, um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's been um, an absolute privilege to, to listen to the speakers today um, and they're just vast experience. Um, and one of the things that I think that I wanted to talk about anyway, mm -hmm. but I keep mm -hmm. hearing is this repeating theme, is this, this theme of empathy, um, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. But um, for the state of Iowa, for anybody that's not familiar with uh, refugees or how that process works. Um, I always preface that conversation with what's going on right now in refugee resettlement with just the notion that uh, migration has been going on in Iowa um, since the beginning of time that you know people came to Iowa either as indigenous community members, as immigrants, as refugees, or as slaves. There's, there's not really a, a good fourth checkbox there if um, if your family is from Iowa. So um, although refugee resettlement as we know it today, the modern resettlement program was established in the mid-70s after the fall of Saigon, um, that obviously Iowa has been welcoming people, um, refugees, um, you know, since uh, Europeans um, first, first came to the United States. So, you know, currently in the world we have 82.4 million displaced people of that number, most people, if you could imagine having to flee your house in the middle of the night with your family, which I'm sure a lot of people are seeing um, images of um, as they're watching events unfold in Ukraine, but also with what happened in Afghanistan. But most people do want to return home. Um, so the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR, is the organization internationally that processes every single application. Whether you become a displaced person, you are uh, designated a refugee, or if you're uh, applying for asylum, um, 
So of that 82.4 million people, 24 million are actually considered refugees. So if you ever hear the numbers, uh, different numbers being used, that's why. Um, and yeah, in, in the state of Iowa, we are actually, um, a lot of people don't know, but we are, are internationally known for our leadership in refugee resettlement. In the mid-70s, that uh, welcoming of Southeast Asians wasn't necessarily a, a very popular uh, thing to do um, among either political party. Um, but our governor at the time was Governor Robert Ray. Um, you know, I think a lot of people um, associate his name with having checked boxes, like checking, yes, we will accept people. But he actively fought um, and petitioned multiple um, administrations to be able to bring as many refugees here and to keep those communities together um, really establishing what has become a legacy of that leadership around the world. Um, first with what were considered boat people. Um, that was the term that was used at that time. Also um, with the Thai Dom. So they had uh, written letters to all 50 governors around the country asking that they wanted their community kept together. They wanted to keep their community and culture intact. Um, he was the only one that responded. And so he went to President Ford um, and resettlement was not done this way at the time and said we want to bring all 3,000 plus people here together and they did. So we actually have the, lar the largest Thai Dom community outside of Vietnam in the world. Um, and you know on a trip back to Cambodia a few years later they uh, were in a building there um, and there was a map of a DOT map of Iowa on the wall that they considered their beacon of hope. Um, so, you know, since we've, we've welcomed 40,000 refugees and plus to the state of Iowa, um, in the Des Moines Public Schools, we have 148 languages, and that's 10 plus students speaking those languages. Um, and really, you know, you talk about a, a topic that is currently very relevant. I mean, 24 million people, it's a lot of people. Um, the average wait time um, as people are being processed in those UNHCR refugee camps in 2017 was was 17 years hmm. um, so people oftentimes you know you see Afghans that was a humanitarian crisis arriving very quickly but oftentimes uh, people are, are in refugee camps for a long time while they're waiting to come here sometimes there's school um, oftentimes not sometimes you can work a lot of times you can't and a lot of times those refugee camps themselves are at risk of further violence which is um, a really big issue that was happening in the, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia just this past year. So we, um, the um, current administration um, under that um, number of refugees that was determined to be, uh, to come into the United States this year, we were uh, hoping to resettle about a thousand people from all over the world. We actually had a, a case, um, a special immigrant visa case that was resolved um, this past year, so someone from Vietnam that had applied um, during that Vietnam War era was actually just brought last year. Um, so we settle a lot of people from Burma, um, from or um, the English word Myanmar. We um, settle a lot of people from the Democratic Republic of Congo. We settle a lot of people from Eritrea, from Somalia, um, and from a lot of other places. We obviously have a large community of Bosnian, um, former refugees and, and Sudanese as well. Um, and this year alone, we'll actually be adding an extra thousand uh, people that came here from Afghanistan out of that 100,000 that were able to flee and, and enter the United States. Um, and then in addition, you know, we are looking at, at events unfolding in, in Ukraine and um, the UN today released that they estimate a, between one and five million people will become refugees if if violence continues. So we've seen 500,000 leaves so far. And of course, you know, I also, um, on, that, on that note of empathy, you know, the reason why I think if you look at refugee resettlement staff members, the resounding uh, character trait that we all share in, in, in multitude uh, in numbers is, is empathy. Um, and I remember reading Anne Frank, I snuck it from my older sister, actually. <laughs> my parents didn't know. I think I was seven. But I remember reading that. And then in high school, reading our student paper, and it was an interview of a friend of mine who was from Bosnia, and her journey 
um, leaving Bosnia. And if you've ever seen the movie In the Land of Blood and Honey, um, the majority of things described in that movie um, this seven-year-old girl had witnessed firsthand, and I had, you know, no idea. Um, and that, you know, that, that book, that, that article, a few other pieces of literature that really allow young adults, young kids in particular, to, you know, really develop this, like, true sense of connection, this deeper understanding of other people that aren't their immediate family, that aren't their immediate friend group, um, is just absolutely imperative, you know, if we want to see the number 82.4 million become lower anytime soon. I mean, having worked in international development for many years, I, I truly believe that education um, is, is the most important, uh, you know, basic infrastructure that, uh, that the world could invest in to solve the, the majority of its problems. Um, and yeah, so I mean, I think that, um, as we, you know, as we all sit here and, and watch um, what's happening in Ukraine, what has happened in Afghanistan, um, it's been a very busy year for refugee resettlement agencies. Um, but um, the, I, you know, I just would also like to note too. I think that there's a lot of people working in resettlement that would say, you know, the day that shelling started in Ukraine, um, bombs were also falling in Somalia mm -hmm. and in Eritrea. And in Yemen, um, in Yemen and Somalia, there's at least 500,000 civilians that have perished since that those civil conflicts have began. Um, there's, you know, a lot of our community, like a lot of my personal uh, friends from Karen and, and Chin communities in Burma who have family and friends that are being displaced that, um, you know, it is very relevant. It's happening every day. And again, if we want to see, you know, those trends, those numbers, those issues, if we want any chance of seeing those resolved for our future generations, that, I mean, that empathy is is where we really need to start. Gosh, thank you so much, Stephanie. And now, Wilhelm, I wonder if we could go to you. And uh, um, you're from Germany, and uh, you uh, have told me that one of the things you've done in recent years is work on a curriculum for police uh, trainees, police officers, um, uh, as they go through their education uh, related to human rights and the rights of those who may be protesting or, or speaking uh, um, in ways that, that might cause some concern to governmental uh, um, leaders. So tell us something about the curriculum you created for police uh, education. Okay, thank you for the honor to speak here. Uh, my topic here is the question, is policing a human rights profession? 10 years ago, on the occasion of a police art exhibition, I was asked if I could interview policemen and police women about the daily work and the stresses associated with it. In the last 10 years, this request has turned into more than 100 qualitative empirical interviews, and I have developed a curriculum on police ethics for the police in Baden-Württemberg. To regard the police as a human rights profession is surprising at first glance, given recent abuses by the police in Germany, which involved massive violence. What could it mean? In Germany, both police officers, uh, both in the state and in the federal police forces, are trained in police academies at intermediate level and in police universities in, at the higher and senior levels. Training takes a total of three to five years and further qualifications are then possible at the German Police University in Münster. In my remarks, I am referring to the situation in the state of Baden-Württemberg. As a course subject, professional ethics is compulsory in all colleges and universities of the police. My first proposition, 
policing is not a human rights profession, but it has a connection to human rights and fundamental rights. The term human rights profession was coined by the German social scientist Silvia Staub Bernasconi for social work. Interestingly, the term now also appears in recent publications on police work. The police shall uphold law and order in accordance with the Constitution and ensure the unimpeded exercise of civil rights. Thus, fundamental rights under the German Constitution, the basic law, may be restricted only under certain conditions. But the necessity of such, such restrictions must be legally demonstrated be proportionate. Police orders and decrees must also be justifiable based on provisions of the law and may not be in any way arbitrary. Police work is therefore always faced with an ethical dilemma. On the one hand, the law and also the constitutional order in a democratic civil society must be protected and also enforced by violent means based on the state's monopoly on the use of force. While on the other hand, there are constitutional and legal limitations that define the legal scope for police action and serve to protect citizens. In order to, to be described as a human rights profession, apart from a connection to fundamental and human rights, there is also a need for training and continuing education in human rights, as well as self-empowerment to reflect on everyday police work from a human rights perspective. Respect for fundamental rights, protection of the constitutional order, the training of police officers and also individual ethical sanitization with regards to the law should all be part of the scope of reflection on human rights in police work. From an ethical point of view, this dimension is crucial so that police actions can be evaluated evaluated ethically. <clears throat> the personality of the police officer is the key factor when it comes to combining police work with ethical reflection and conduct. Relevant topics in the context of this combination are, for example, the handling of violence in the manner that violence is experienced or legitimately, illegitimately exercised violence, or the combination of a professional role with the person's identity as a police officer and how this fits into the police organization, or also the relationship between shame and guilt in police work. Ethical problem areas include, for example, social or racial profiling or combating anti-Semitism, right-wing or left-wing extremism, as well as counter-terrorism. However, it is poisonous for cohesion in a democratic society if trust in the police is eroded due to illegitimate violence. Respect for human rights is central to police work. Human rights should not only be learned in police training, but continuously applied, practiced, and reflected upon in practical situations. An understanding of human rights cannot be taken for granted and must first be learned. The human rights concept of dignity means standing up for one's own rights and equal rights for everyone empowerment and solidarity. 
Human rights education is especially important for the police because their first task is to protect human rights and not protect law and order. That is a Nazi jargon, uh, and this state of um, our police is the resistance against um, the police in Nazi time, um, because you know Gestapo and police and SS um, were instruments of terrorism. Mm. Human rights education is part of police officers' personality development and is linked to their own understanding of dignity. Forming values and developing a value system is an active construction task for the individual and cannot be assumed as a given. Police work, too, does not take place on a distant planet, must, but must deal with so-called changing values in a pluralistic society, also reflectively. The adoption of the value-based corporate identity of the respective police force is related to questions of human rights ethics and reflection on human existence. The study of professional ethics is one of the primary educational goals in ethical respects within the everyday professional practice of the police. The aims of police professional ethics are, first, to be able to recognize and describe ethical aspects in police actions. Second, to be able to analyze the possibilities for action in such situations. Third, to be able systematically to arrive at a decision. And fourth, to reflect on one's own moral standpoint. Not only the individual connection to values is relevant here, but also whether the police has as an, as an organization, an institution as a whole, has an organizational ethics in its processes and procedures that is designed around human rights. The ability to make ethical judgment is a skill that has to be acquired and should be developed in a targeted manner. Police officers should be able to reflect on their own suffering of violence and learn to recognize the turning point in their own behavior where the suffering of violence leads to an illegitimate use of violence. And it's true that the more nuanced the development of personal ethical competence is, the better the police leader can reflect on ethical matters in conflict situations and, for example, focus on cooperative behavior in the leadership style which in turn has impacts on the emotional and mental balance of the person. Thank you very much. How, uh, so interesting for us to learn about this, this um, process of, of learning about ethics, having this being part of the teaching curriculum uh, for police officers at every level in, uh, in Germany. Uh, when did you begin your work in this area? Um, since um, 2011. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you see improvements, do you, over time in the way police uh, understand their ethical responsibilities? Slowly, step by step. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, to organize ethic reflections is a, is a hard work. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, teaching ethics uh, not as an abstract uh, matter yeah. um, is, is a chance, uh, but it can be the hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, what an interesting evening we've had. I can't thank you all enough. I want to say thank you to Stephanie Morris, just next to me here, Esther Hugenholt uh, in the middle, and uh, thank you very much, Wilhelm Schwendemann, and all of our guests who were with us earlier this evening. It's been a wonderful discussion. And thank, thanks to all of you who've come to be with us and those watching uh, on the uh, recording. Uh, I want to invite everyone who's interested to attend any of the panel discussions that will be happening in the next two days. Um, they will be happening in various places on campus, and there is a film screening as well included in this Provost Global Forum. Um, there will be a lecture on Wednesday evening given by Ronald Leopold, the director of the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, on Wednesday evening, the Joel Barkin Memorial Lecture. And as for World Canvas, we hope you'll join us for the final program of the season here in this room on March 31st. And uh, the topic is corruption, the rise of populism, and the future of democracy. And considering what's happening in the world, I, I think it's a program to pay attention to. Um, for international programs at the University of Iowa, I'm Joan Kerr. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.